Um, thank you all for being here. Um, both Barry and I really had the nicest day yesterday, uh, hearing from some of the students, meeting some faculty, just getting a sense of what goes on here now, which is in some ways very different from when I was here so long ago, but in other ways not so different. The excitement and the intelligence of the students really wowed us all. Um, I'm just very grateful to have been invited to participate in this. When I entered Union in the fall of 1971 as part of the second class of women, an early pleasure was the beautiful retreat we know as Jackson's Garden. And since we're honoring the past today, I thought I'd start with a little bit of this history. Isaac Jackson, the garden's founder and first caretaker, graduated from Union in 1826. Having studied mathematics, philosophy, and classics, he stayed on as a tutor of math and was promoted in 1831 to professor of mathematics. Before long, and at the urging of President Eliphalet Knott, who suggested that gardening might help the professor's chronic dyspepsia, where can that have come from? <laughs> he began tending some scrubby, overgrown acres along Hans Groot's kill. Often referred to as Captain Jack because of his role in the college cadets and his continued delights in military drills, he was described in one student diary as a little man about four feet nine inches tall with a high receding forehead, sharp eyes, and a remarkably intelligent fizz. Other sources note that he adored exotic plants and went to great pains to obtain a small specimen of the ginkgo tree, which later grew to enormous size, and roots of Japanese tree peonies. He lived with his wife in North College faculty uh, housing, mentoring and supervising the residence hall students, while also raising five children of his own. After he died in 1877, a student praised him generously in the first issue of the Concordiensis, writing that, though scholarly in all his tastes and habits, he could not be a recluse or a bookworm. The garden where for so many years he toiled and planned bears witness to his fond appreciation of natural beauty. A little bit after that pleasant and conventional sentiment comes a line noting the, that the acerbity of manner, which Jackson occasionally assumed, was a transparent disguise which could not conceal, even from his dog, the innate kindliness of his heart. Those details, especially the chronic dyspepsia and the acerbity of manner, make me want to write a story. So does a moment's reflection about the wife who shared his home in North College, surrounded by students and pressed into hostess duties for so many men over so many years. Then I think about the daughters who grew up there, one of whom would later take over the garden, and the son who died during the Civil War, and the impact of the Civil War on the college, and the ripples that spread out from any life. But any story inspired by those scraps of history wouldn't turn out to resemble whatever I can imagine right now. Inevitably, and probably painfully, it would turn into something quite different, which I can't describe to you because I haven't written it. Stories are born in the actual act of putting words onto paper, each choice and each mistake leading to another. They turn into themselves when I listen to what they're trying to tell me, which is always less obvious and more complicated than what I first imagined. Mostly that means I have to pay attention to the part of me that says, no, not that path, not that word, not that point of view, not that action or that line of dialogue, not that sentence or the next or the one after that. Throw that out and move on. I learned to do this by failing again and again. First generally for years, as I tried to figure out what I might be good at and might want to do. I failed to graduate from high school, almost failed out of union my first year, failed at my first choice of majors, and failed twice in two different fields to finish graduate school. 
For a decade after graduating, I failed to find any satisfying occupation. I worked as a receptionist, then as a billing clerk, and then as a customer service representative in a corrugated box factory. I was a greenhouse technician and a helper in a biological supply company, a trainer at a test preparation service, and only for three days, because the blood made me faint, an assistant to a dental surgeon. Yeah, I was great at that. <laughs> Later, I was an annual fund clerk and then a research assistant in a college development office, a secretary to a biophysicist and an assistant to a group of endocrinologists at a medical school, a tax form typist for an accounting firm, and finally, a freelance proofreader, copy editor, and then an editor at a medical publisher. I learned lots of those jobs including something about being patient with other people's demands on my time and what it was like to be labeled by what I did for work. Even once I started writing, I kept failing, as I still fail. I make my work by way of endless drafts and endless revision, which is a kinder word for repeated failures and one I'll switch to here. It's a good word, a crucial part of my work and my life. I tried twice to teach a course about revision during the 15 years I worked with undergraduate writing students. I found it useful to look at the early drafts and notebooks of writers I'd learned from and loved, to, rest, to root through drafts of Virginia Woolf's novels, say, and see her huge excitement as she charged down one false path after another to read the early version of The Great Gatsby called Trimalchio, which its editor described as like listening to a well-known musical composition, but played in a different key and with an alternate bridge passage. Or to find that Tolstoy had started Anna Karenina quite impulsively, deep in the process of gathering material and taking notes toward what was meant to be a novel set in the time of Peter the Great. His new work, he wrote to a friend, was a novella he expected to finish in two weeks. Four years later, having started with a character sometimes called Tatiana or Nana, graceless and vulgar in his early drafts, almost ugly, and married to a saintly husband, he finished the novel we know. That course was itself a kind of failure. I'd misread both the students' interest in revision and where they were in their own writing lives. But along the way, I learned things that wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't wholeheartedly thrown myself at the task, each time excited by visions that would later prove fruitless. Writing works the same way for me, and in fact, nothing has been more important in my life than the willingness to believe that each new effort won't be a failure and to commit myself to it entirely even though the evidence is that I will, in fact, fail again. Tolstoy called the blinkered energy that sends us exploring down paths that often lead nowhere, but which just occasionally result in useful discoveries, the energy of delusion, an earthly, spontaneous energy that's impossible to invent. Ideally, that energy is something preserved rather than squelched by our education. It can make us look foolish, but it also makes us smart. Union nurtured that in me, encouraging me to explore different fields and majors and to master different tools and techniques. Sometimes when you're a student, people who really have only your best interests at heart will encourage you to declare your interests early, to find a path and move down it without deviation to take only courses that have some practical relationship to your goals, even to build a social life that might in some way aid you on your path. We might enter college thinking we know where we want to go, what we want to be, how we want to get there, but only a willingness to explore paths on which we might fail lets us unfold into the people we can be. Walking along the paths of Jackson's Garden, you can marvel at all the revisions that over the course of almost two centuries have generated such a complex and lovely space. 
When Jackson first approached that plot, he reportedly found a few beds of poor flowers or vegetables, and adjoining them, a rude, tangled veil. Over the next decades, he'd try out different plants and different designs, ripping out dead plants and substituting others, shaping and then reshaping formal gardens, groves of fruit trees, and woodlands. His daughter, Julia Jackson Benedict, took over after he died and revised his initial visions even more substantially. Alumnus John Van Voost, who followed her, maintained what had grown well over the years, but also added a rose garden and the conservatory. Later caretakers continued adding, changing, destroying, rebuilding, discarding what were once cherished visions to make way for their own. Out goes the elderberry, in comes the witch hazel. In an issue of the 1909 Union Alumni Magazine, an anonymous poem appeared under the title, To Isaac W. Jackson. Of the poem's 20 stanzas, the 14th through 16th are not the most awkward. They go like this. And all who've, had, who've read your optics say, with beauty they are fraught, sir, full of light and clear as day, and eloquent with thought, sir. You breathe life through the ghastly pile of moldy mathematics. You kindle interest by your style in statics and dynamics. You take the student by the hand and sprite of predilections, that word misspelled, he feels he treads a charmed land while conning conic sections. I laughed the first time I read that, a failure of the imagination. Later in the online archive where I found the printed piece, there was a scan of the poem in typescript, essentially the same, but with a few strikeouts, and at the bottom, these additional lines. After the death of Mr. Jackson, these verses were found among his papers. The author is unknown. And suddenly, what I'd responded to as a joke became something intimate, personal, saved for years, perhaps many years, in the drawer of a teacher's desk. What did the writing of the poem mean to the writer? Why did Isaac Jackson save it? And where was it between his death in 1877 and its publication in 1909? Another printed paragraph from the same alumni magazine, torn out of its proper place and scanned sideways against the background of a different page, offers a further comment about the verses. They were found among Professor Jackson's papers after his death with this note, unsigned. By keeping this within your own knowledge, for obvious reasons, you will again oblige one whom you have already many times obliged. After which the writer of the article notes, it would be interesting to know who the unknown author was. Often we don't get to know such things, but we do get to imagine them and to wonder what they mean. Those acts of imagination and wonder generate their own kinds of energy, feeding stories in our lives. Think about that poem and the unknown author's request when you're walking through the garden. Think about Isaac Jackson, his family and his students and the gardeners who followed him, all with their own desires and needs and secrets and successes and failures, almost none of which we know. Start with vegetables, end up with tree peonies. Start tending students, end up tending lilacs. Lives like gardens and stories shift and swerve unexpectedly if we let them, and that's a good thing. Nothing's more useful than the courage to keep revising the way we should live, who we should be, what we can best bring to the world. Uh, thank you all for being here, and thanks to Union for letting me revise. Thank <laughs> you.